Tom Hall, Town Manager Scarborough. Kitty Ward, Chair, Town Council Scarborough. Maxine Major, City Council, South Portland. Tom White, Councilor at Large, South Portland. Uh, Kaylin Jordan, Town Council, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, Mike McGovern, Manager in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, Jim Hughes, uh, City Council, South Portland. <laughs> I want to say Cape Elizabeth, I used to. Do you want to add to our Hi, I'm Patty Smith, City Council, South Portland. Uh, Rosemary DeAngelis, Mayor, South Portland. Frank Gabernale, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Eric Carl Carson, uh, who is the Assistant City Manager and Director of Economic Development for South Portland, and he will be giving us our presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I also want to uh, point out, with us tonight, besides the inspector managers, is Greg, Greg LaRue, who is our Finance Director, uh, all our brief self gen uh, it's pretty much instrumental in getting me to understand the concepts of uh, surrounding this topic. Uh, and Greg Thompson from uh, uh, Freedom Energy Logistics and uh, Keith III from uh, Scarborough. Without further ado, we have something that we think is really exciting. We have an exciting idea that we've been working on. But it's not without some risk. And I know that the idea is, let me give you a brief uh, history lesson. As you can see, we, we have a tremendous amount of uh, energy consumption that is quite rightly mirrored our rates of development. Um, however, by 2000, buildings account for 70% of electric use, electricity use in the U.S. Uh, this, re this represents uh, residential costs in 2009. By comparison, in 2007, average residential retail price of electricity in Maine was uh, 15.16 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, I want to point out particularly Utah, North Carolina, and Washington state, since those are states that we, we compete against on a regular basis for location of uh, information technology and biotech uh, companies. Uh, Utah is, in 2007 was 8.17 cents. North Carolina was 9.35. And Washington was 7.24. The question is always what causes the, or what's the relationship between wholesale uh, electricity rates and, uh, and the price, and it's related directly to natural gas prices, natural gas supply and demand, and production. And uh, the, uh, the green is um, energy market price, and the, the blue is natural gas price. And if you look to the right, August of 2008, what was happening then was uh, Hurricane Katrina and the shutdown of the gas production manufacturer, which caused the, both the gas price to go up and then wholesale electricity to go up. Why are these jobs important? These jobs are important because they're skilled, higher wage jobs. Uh, they reflect the business equipment investment, a portion of which we in municipalities can capture because they, they help establish uh, the region as the go-to place for these sectors. As you see, 60% of the companies in biotech are in uh, Cumberland and York County, and over 50% of information technology are likewise in, in Cumberland and York County. Uh, why are these jobs on the right lost? They were lost primarily because of, of the cost of energy. Energy was the number one reason why these companies uh, either downsized or eliminated, eliminated their main um, uh, activities. What's occurred to get us to this point is uh, deregulation. In 1996, uh, electricity utility deregulated. The purpose was to foster competition. Um, if, you, if you liken it to uh, the breakup, I believe, in the 80s of Ma Bell and the, the Telecommunications Act of 96, um, where you had um, infrastructure, which was represented by the towers, um, versus the carriers who simply rented space or located on the towers. Likewise, you have um, uh, the Central Bank Power, uh, Bangor Hydro, who are the transmission delivery uh, for the competitive energy providers, CEPs that are established, who actually generate or supply the electricity. 
there is pretty much a great wall of China between um, the supply and the, and the energy generation side and the transmission and delivery side. So all that I'm talking about tonight is the, is the supply and generation. The relationship between T and D and C and C and P in our case won't change regardless of who supplies electricity. Um, so the establishment of these uh, competitive energy providers, uh, the oversight comes from a number of agencies. The PUC has uh, a number of rules and regulations regarding energy supply and generation. Uh, ISO New England, which, is the, which serves as the, as, the, as the wholesale market uh, for competitive energy providers, and then for, for those private entities. One of the things that we've noticed, we've discovered in our research, is that as a uh, that municipalities are actually exempt from the Federal Power Act and FERC regulation. Uh, who are these these uh, generators and, and suppliers and aggregators? Let me explain the difference between the two. On the left are, are aggregators or brokers. Uh, these are companies that provide either a brokerage service, as in the case of Freedom Energy, uh, or uh, serve as as aggregators, that is, uh, essentially wholesale retailers or uh, middle, middle people to between the, uh, the ratepayers and the uh, wholesale market. Uh, on the right hand side, you have generators, and a good example is uh, uh, Calpine and Westbrook. Uh, they sell, they, they generate their electricity, they sell it directly to uh, the grid. Um, when, we, when we started talking about the development of this project in South Portland, um, we put out an RFP, RFQ, and, and Freedom Energy responded. Uh, they represent approximately 54% of the companies that are part of the New England Pool Wholesale members. Within the three communities, uh, we have this breakdown in terms of residential and commercial uh, uh, accounts. And uh, when we initially started to look at this, we were focusing on municipal accounts. Um, how can we, with the point being, how can we save municipalities money and, and save taxpayer uh, money through, uh, by avoiding uh, potential increases based on, on energy costs? Much of our, uh, of all of our communities tend to, to purchase power from either main power options, I believe is the, is the one that typically represents municipalities, and even longer two-year contracts. So then we started to look at, um, well, what can we, how do we build in, how can we, should we build in residential and commercial markets, uh, the commercial being small and, and medium accounts, with the idea of how can we provide um, ratepayers, i.e. residents, i.e. taxpayers, a, uh, some kind of savings through the wholesale purchase. Um, working with self-gen, uh, this identifies the general energy model in the center. Is initially, we had considered, considered it as an LLC, uh, but we do uh, realize now we could have a municipally owned, wholly owned uh, uh, organization, and here, in this case, South Point Energy, calling it Tri-Community Energy, however, whatever you want to call it, uh, with the idea of, of becoming a wholesale energy supply group, uh, developing a load asset account on the ISO of New England um, uh, market, purchasing electricity in a number of ways on the upper left hand corner, either through day ahead markets or uh, real time markets, um, and then there are other models, 30 day markets. Essentially, the flexibility to buy energy when it's, when it's inexpensive and to shed or to sell that energy when it becomes more expensive but some other entity needs it. Uh, by way of example, much of the energy that is created in uh, uh, New Brunswick and, and uh, the Maritimes and uh, Hydro-Quebec is funneled down to Connecticut, uh, New York, Long Island, uh, where that's the greatest, greatest level of service that's required. Um, the other thing that, 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 that can feed the, the supply to the wholesale energy group um, is purchased from either um, alternative sources like 
and renewable sources like wind, um, as it's developed uh, biomass plants. And I, we've already had a couple of biomass plants in the state um, express interest in selling uh, the energy company electricity. Uh, but we have a number of options in that regard uh, for purchase and then sale. Down at the bottom are uh, some projections, and these were initial projections about savings. Uh, all along, our numbers seem to uh, suggest a 5 to 10 percent savings for the residential and small business user. Um, the medium, medium uh, and large accounts operate on, on a much different kind of approach, uh, and they are closer to true wholesale than uh, the residential and, and small business. But again, focusing on the residential and small business to start. Uh, so the, the key difference here is, is between the standard offers, which most of us, probably all of us, uh, is how we purchase our electricity. Uh, the state puts out a, a bid, uh, a request for bids. There are at least six different companies, suppliers, generators, that will provide it, that may provide a bid. I believe in this last round, two uh, companies uh, uh, replied, and they established, the PUC established, a uh, rate beginning this, this spring at 8.49 8 cents per kilowatt at the residential and small business uh, uh, market. Uh, the, the difference for this is, and the reason why there is a difference, and I, and I I'll show this one, bear with me, but there's, there's, a, there's a gap between the standard offer and the wholesale that, that remains regardless of the cost of energy, and that's a function of the need for, for standard offer to uh, carry a little bit more risk um, and more predictability over the course of the year than the wholesale power purchases, because wholesale power can be purchased on a, on a very short basis for a very short period of time, as I noticed, as I mentioned before, real, real time, day ahead. Um, and we can talk about those as we go forward. Uh, the other thing, though, is that, the, is that the standard offer also assumes, because they, they have to offer to, to all, there is a larger uh, uh, credit risk in terms of having to take all of the customers. Uh, so the, the companies that, that uh, provide the standard offer, answer the standard offer, build in these, these margins. Um, the wholesale purchase, power purchase process is, is very much like stock trading. And then you have a market that has uh, literally real time. You can go to the ISO uh, website and you can watch the, the price of the wholesale price change every five minutes uh, and based on, on supply, based on demand, based on temperature. Uh, and so these kinds of pricings allow for greater uh, flexibility and uh, lower costs. The other thing is that the standard offer, is, as I said before, is required to take everyone. Whereas um, the state has a has a law uh, where you have to opt in to choose a provider. And every year you get a you get a, a second page to your bill that asks you, do you want to stay with X supplier or do you want to choose another supplier? Some folks in the, in the past, Interfaith Power Light was a was a aggregator, um, and they had a, 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 a contractual arrangement with Constellation Energy. And the purpose of that uh, program was to buy uh, all renewable energy, uh, buy, buy all of the energy from renewable sources. It was more expensive than the standard offer, uh, but it did give people what I, what I would call a sleep well kind of sense because you, you felt, you know, you believed you were uh, uh, making a statement and making, making a difference in your purchasing power. So the cost to collect greater level of business risk of higher number, higher number of customers and uh, the process of standard offer is used to develop. Uh, in terms of a wholesale energy supplier, what's involved in becoming a wholesale energy supplier? The city solicited qualifications for brokerage services and FAL responded. So one thing would be to establish a broker contract. The process requires licensing from the PUC uh, to become a competitive energy provider license. You see that you establish a, uh, uh, a deposit.
deposit account, uh, which may or may not be negotiable at the outset, but then you, you have a deposit based on the percentage of the customers you, you have over the course of the year. Um, you, with ISO, in Wigley, you set up a load asset account, which, is, which effectively does two things. It says, we're going to buy at least a meg, one megawatt hour of electricity from the grid, and you're going to guarantee that we'll have access to that. Um, and in order to do that, there are a number of charges that, that go along with that that sort of bind the two, beyond, the, beyond the actual contractual relationship, bind the two parties. Um, and uh, so you, you set up an escrow account from which uh, ISO and Wigley draws. They, they changed that, used to draw once a week, now they draw twice a weekly, which provides a savings uh, uh, over the long term. And there are participation fees, etc. CMP would continue to perform the billing. There's no change in that regard. They actually uh, they, they provide a service to suppliers and generators, uh, 26 cents per per uh, per bill per month, uh, including the bill in their service. They they are paid first, and then any back CMP uh, payment uh, is paid, and the supplier is paid third. The generator is paid third. Uh, this is an example of the, the, the kind of charges and components of a typical wholesale account. And you see here, we, you, know, you pay a charge for the energy itself. Um, you pay a capacity load application charge. Again, you're saying, I'm, gonna, I'm guaranteeing I'm going to buy that much. Um, and, and the ISO is going to supply that. There, there are several reserve markets you can such and, and uh, funds you have to pay into. And then there are other tariffs and, and uh, New England power pool expenses. At the end, however, it remains less expensive than the standard offer. Uh, as we develop this model uh, from a municipal standpoint, uh, city city sustainability coordinator Anna Powell and I have reviewed state and federal agency rules and procedures for the provision of wholesale power. So one of the things that we identified as we built the model was we said we're going to need staffing right away. We're going to need staffing. We looked at having two people, uh, two full time, one for accounts receivable uh, and one for marketing. Uh, we, we realized we would need legal and auditing services. Uh, the PUC requires a year of audit. Uh, credit evaluation services, and this is an important piece because. Um, because of the, as we develop the model, and we, look, and we said, you know, because we're, we're public agencies, we're, we have our, our uh, stockholders, our taxpayers, we need transparency, and we need to ensure that we provide them the lowest level of risk possible. And to do that, there are a number of services that will review uh, uh, residential credit and business profile credit, uh, which would thus allow us to uh, most effectively manage the risk, manage the level of bad debt. Again, these are a function of opt-in because people can always have the option of the standard standard offer. Uh, and then the establishment of working capital needs. So there, there are four goals for this as, as the community sat down and started to discuss this. Uh, and the first was to reduce costs to residential small business customers. And that, that, that was the first piece. We do it through the wholesale power purchase. We use the ISO grid um, as, our, as our network. And the, the intent is to have um, uh, a 5 to 10 percent savings over standard offer. Um, the, the second goal was how soon can our investment be repaid? The municipalities will have to put money forward to establish the escrow accounts, to establish the, the pay the necessary fees, their application fees to uh, uh, ISO and to PUC. Uh, not much. I mean, PUC, I believe, is a $400 fee, uh, uh, for instance, for the application. But how, how soon can we, can we recover these upfront business expenses? Uh, one of the ways to do it would be to stag stagger the offer and take on certain 
maybe take within the first two months, take out one meg of power purchase. Uh, within um, another two months, take out another meg of power purchase, which is about uh, a meg is about 2,000 customers, uh, residential and, and business. Uh, the, the, the purpose is to, is to minimize our upfront costs um, at the same time recognizing that, there is a, that we maintain necessary sufficient cash flow to make the project go forward. The third goal would be to create an enterprise account and I want to stress that the, the idea here was if there was over time uh, revenues that were generated that those revenues could be uh, captured and utilized much as we use a, uh, our TIF accounts or we use um, uh, reserve accounts. Uh, but again, with the idea uh, of savings above what we had projected 5 to 10% uh, as they potentially uh, appear to use those to offset, offset um, expenses from project costs through the general fund. The fourth goal goes back to the, the initial idea of protecting existing job base, you know, and setting growth. As, as the region has, has grown in strength and economic strength, and as this region is, for all intents and purposes, in many ways, the state's economic engine, uh, we want to encourage that. And the way to continue to encourage that is to provide assistance to business to, to uh, encourage job development and job growth and, and minimize what we can. What we can through this process would be to minimize um, uh, business electricity costs. The other, the other idea would be is to, to serve as, as a potential catalyst for another model that may come from the state or from the region. Um, the question was asked in earlier meetings with my council, um, you know, what if the standard offer what if the wholesale price of the standard offer end up being the same? Well, then the point of it all is that the cost of electricity has come down sufficiently to create these savings. Um, because of the, of the way that energy is purchased, it's unlikely, I, my understanding is, it's unlikely the standard offer will go away um, anytime soon. Uh, but I wanted to address that. So again, go back to these, these jobs. This information, um, you know, it, it reflects business equipment investment. Um, and we want these. We want this uh, skill, high wage job creation to occur. Um, there's a lot of thoughts here. There's a lot of things uh, we have to think about. Um, you'll, you'll have a lot of questions, and I encourage you to ask them. Let me offer these questions in terms of popular questions. Um, should this be a function of municipal government? The nature of the venture of the enemy will require substantial cash flow infusion. What are the options? Uh, what's our expectation for return on investment? The obstacles to the greatest level of service within the communities. How do we um, ensure that we provide as much uh, of an option to as many people as possible while at the same time uh, minimizing our business risk as a, as a community or as a, as a group? Uh, looking at the credit risk and worthiness, there are a number of, of uh, community action agencies that provide uh, low and no interest loans for, for home repair, for instance. They have a process whereby someone uh, reviews uh, an applicant's credit history. It's, it's done confidentially, but the idea is to ensure that the, the investment of that agency uh, is well put. Uh, we do the same thing in South Portland when we we have a municipal revolving loan application and we have a CDBG loan with um, And then that's the question, you know, what's the interest in forming the strike community in our use of There's a lot of opportunity of late for regional activity, for collaborative activity. We've done, we've done collaborative, um, uh, had collaborative activities uh, available to us, opportunities to us in the past. We want to continue that. Uh, there is a strong push within the region to see itself as a strong region and to see itself in a regional perspective. Uh, 
with that, I would um, open it up for questions. And I guess what I, what I would suggest is if you have questions about what I've said so far and would like some clarification, um, I, we, could, we could do that and then go to the larger questions or we could just jump right in fairly. I'd be easy if you came over here because this will pick up the sound. Sure. I've got a um, sort of conceptual question. Not having any benefit of um, previous discussions on this. Just to, so I clearly understand this now, right now, essentially, CMP provides the function of uh, being the intermediary, intermediary between the buyers and the producer. Is that correct? Their, their service is entirely in transmission and delivery. Right. So between the buyers and, yeah. and the energy producer. Yeah. So they, they do the billing, the collection, all that stuff, plus they transport it and they service. That's correct. So what you're talking about here is basically taking the CMP uh, function and dividing it into several parts. Um, you have a broker buying capacity. You have CMP doing some of the billing that you described. Uh, the, the, the difference is that that we would purchase electricity the same way that um, Constellation purchases electricity, the same way that other uh, suppliers that, that you purchase electricity directly from the grid, and then using the transmission and delivery system of CMP, which everyone uses. Right. Um, so who purchases electricity now? Is it CMP? Or? No. Um, it, depending upon who who uh, um, Constellation. Is one um, Florida Power and Light? Um, <coughs> those are the two that come to mind right off. They and, and Florida Power and Light, for instance, is a generator. Uh, Constellation, I believe, is a is a supplier. And so, you for the for the intent of this discussion, uh, we're looking at, at creating a supply company. We may purchase electricity from a generator, like a biomass plant up in Greenville, for instance. Or, but from another, we might buy energy from uh, you know a local generator. Uh, but the purpose would be to serve as a supplier. CMP will at CMP's role as di dis uh, distributor of the electricity would remain the same. Right. And you said they do billing as well. Yes. You got they don't do collections. They they do do collections. No, no. In this setup, they wouldn't do collections. You said you had to set up uh, a collection system or that. We have some options. They could they could do collections. Um, as I said, they 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 um, when they do their billing, they pay themselves first. They pay any past CMP bill for second. Then they, then the the bill goes to the supplier. Um, the, the balance goes to the supplier. Uh, when uh, and I'm just trying to think. That's not, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I think of the, the hierarchy of the structure today in the building block trying to figure out where the municipalities can play those roles. So you've got the energy, energy generator, then you have the broker or buyer of the energy, and then you've got CMP. Well, you got a supplier. If we, our role would be a supplier. I'm talking about what we have today. Yeah. So you have the energy generator, right? Then you've got an entity which purchases it or, or uh, sells the energy. It's sort of the broker of the energy, correct? Mm -hmm. And then you have CMP which distributes and services and bills. Yes. So when you think of those kind of four building blocks, the municipal entity is the buyer, is the broker, essentially. The, so municipal, you, the, municip the municipality would be the supplier. We would hire a broker to act just as you hire a broker for stuff. So when you think about cost savings, you're cutting out the margin of the broker. Essentially. Yes, That's right. That's That's exactly it. right. Yeah, maybe a different way to look at it, and my numbers may be totally off, but let's look at the cost of power. Say it's 15 cents, and the people who are smarter than I am in this room that can correct me, but of that 15 cents, uh, let's assign seven of it to transmission and delivery. So that's CMP's number. We're not talking about that at all. That is what it is, and it will continue to be so. The remaining 8 cents is what we're talking about. Uh, right now, that 8 cents is probably on the wholesale Again, for discussion purposes, say it's six cents is the wholesale price. Right. The other two cents, someone's making money on right. the broker. Right. So it's that margin, it's that two cents that we think uh, there's some room to to benefit our. So one has to assume either you're going to be a better buyer, a better broker, or you're eliminating inefficiencies in the operation. Well, we can buy at the, the wholesale price, and we don't have the profit motive. Um, right, so you're cutting out the profit margin. 
I'm just trying to get right to it. Because you, you're not making the assumption that you're purchasing the electricity cheaper than the broker. You're so simply we're selling it cheaper than the broker. Right, you eliminate it. We could, I mean, conceivably, when I, when I talk about the, the enterprise account, you could conceivably become a supplier, sell it for, for you know, one mil, two mils less than standard offer, and take, take the difference and put it into a, into a, a savings account, I mean, essential. That's just as a for-profit does. Yeah, Eric had mentioned there was a number of goals, kind of the hierarchy of goals. The first one being delivering cost savings to residents and, and business accounts. Uh, we can talk about what that is. We think comfortably it's in the 5 to 10 percent range. Uh, if that margin gets greater, uh, there's other things we can do. We can hold some of that margin back for ourselves, uh, whether it's to do whatever you choose on a municipal level. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, return on our initial investment is an important one as well. What's the experience been of other municipalities undertaking this? It's been unproven. No, That's, uh, uh, no, one, else no, no one else done it. What, the, 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 the best um, uh, comparable example are a number of municipalities in the Midwest, uh, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, that have, have signed on with a very large scale aggregator who, who is selling essentially what, what I would term probably poorly wholesale retail electricity. Um, less than less than retail, but not as good as wholesale. But a number of municipalities, and what they've done is they've simply combined all of these accounts into one, which allows for savings by virtue of the the, the, the level of the load asset. But there have been no other municipalities that save the two we have in the state, or the I should there's I think there's about four that are actually utilities, Kennebunk. Kennebunk Power and Light, uh, Madison Electric Works, uh, Fox Island Thoroughfare, Fox Island Cooperative, and there's one more, there's one up north, I think, um, that are utilities and that supply and transmit the, the electricity. Eric, are you aware of anyone that's uh, doing the same, in the same process where it is? Uh, in, within the state? Yeah. Um, there have been other municipalities. I think I think a number of municipalities have been kind of looking at us and seeing what this looks like, um, but I don't believe anyone has is, is, is gone as far along as we have in, in examining. Uh, the, 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 I can say a little bit about the process. So I say the the best time to purchase electricity on the wholesale market to establish a load account is either in the springtime or the or the fall, um, and it can be significantly less expensive. So the idea would be to um, uh, establish this, this entity as people so chose, uh, for, you know, do the application process and start to, start to assemble the market and assemble the customer base in preparation for a you know, day of opening, uh, which would be timed with being able to capture electricity at, a, at an optimum rate. So, um, I have a couple of questions. Do you have a sense of what the average um, electricity bill is per residence? In the average is uh, the average use for residential is 750 um, um, kilowatt hours. So it's about 60 dollars a month. That's an, that's an average now. If you have a hot tub, you're gonna you're gonna pay a lot more but in the winter. That's for a residential. That's a residential. Customer. And how about uh, for for a business? How about for a business? Uh, the, the average use is about 2,500 kilowatt hours. Um, coolers, lighting, machinery, equipment, um, and that it's about two hundred dollars a month. It's gotta be more than sixty because I'm using five hundred kilowatt. Just the supply side. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I, I'm speaking only of the supply side. Okay. So, in the case, for instance, of residential, uh, you would add six point six point seven cents for for T and D on top of that. In 2009, the average electric bill in the state of Maine was about eighty-seven dollars residential. Right, but it, I, I'm just I'm assuming that the transmission, say C and P, is just doing its thing. Right. You know, either way, no matter what we do. So if the average supply 
electrical bill, and that's per month, right? Sixty dollars for residents, two hundred for a business, and you said you projected ten percent savings between five and ten percent. Ten percent. So say it's ten percent. We'll say it's the best. So that's six dollars a month, right? Right. And. Could you tell me what the initial, we talked about all the initial investment and the two FTEs and all that kind of stuff. Could, could you tell me about initial investment and then sort of ongoing sure. operational costs for, you know, additional costs that we'd have to. I don't, I, I have to say we haven't broken it down by, by uh, per residential account or per business account. No, that's okay. Uh, well, it, I, so the numbers are a little, probably scary or, or large to begin with. Um, but, you know, for the first month, we figure about $57,000. That includes application fees, one-time application fees, for instance. This is where you start to get into the building of the, of the business model. And it really, in, in all fairness, depends upon the number of accounts that you have. The greater number of accounts you have, uh, the greater revenue you begin to, to generate within two to three months. If we figure a 55-day um, uh, cycle, maximum cycle for account receivables, um, some, something along those lines. Um, so I'm just looking for order of magnitude. I'm just trying to sort of get a sense of this. So 57,000 the first month, does it go down? Significantly? Yeah, in this yes, it month? should, because again, I mean, the first month you're paying, you know, a, 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 a fee for services to the broker, for instance. You're paying uh, uh, ISO participant fees. You're paying... So thereafter, what would months thereafter be? Eric, I, I think what she's getting at is, I think, how much working capital would we need to establish as a tri-town entity to account for the receivables, to account for yes. the fees, to account Thank for... You, Mike. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. The Okay, could you go with us a mic? Yeah. That, that, that's a, that is the big question. Uh, and one of the things, one of our, our concerns is the working capital. Because what you have here is that you start paying the bill to the electric, electrical supply, you know, where you're paying for the electricity. And you don't actually collect from the consumer for approximately 50 to 60 days. And so in that regards, there's a considerable receivable that gets built in the, in the working capital model. So in that regard, we're talking that you're going to need approximately, depending upon the number of accounts you set up, uh, it could be uh, 700, 800, 900 to a million dollars of working capital uh, to service uh, three or 4,000 customers. Uh, the reason being is that above and beyond the, re the receivables that you're going to have for the consumers, is that you also have to have money uh, set aside for the ISO in New England. Uh, they want to make sure that you have an escrow account <laughs> sufficient that you're always going to be able to pay the bill. Uh, the PUC is going to require that you have a $100,000 escrow deposit uh, as a reserve to ensure that you're going to be able to supply so they have a safety net function that, that becomes there also. So, we're looking at that it would be very uh, conceivable that the working capital requirements would be approximately a million dollars. If we wanted to escalate that up to six or seven or eight thousand customers, then it would grow proportionally also. Uh, so we're talking a real significant capital investment. A lot of that capital investment is working capital, so you've got to think of it as once the bills are paid uh, and the consumer pays the bill, your working capital is just going to go continue in that same cycle. So if you were to cease operations, you would ultimately collect the receivables so your working capital would get returned to you. So it isn't a permanent working capital, it's a it's just like any business operations, the, you know, at, over time you'll build up profit within the entity and the working capital requirements would reduce. So, but that's a long-term proposition, and that's one of the, the heart of the, some of our concerns is the working capital requirements. Thank you. 
Um, as you look at this longer term, are there any breakthrough opportunities? Um, and one of our problems in the state is that we purchase very expensive production. We would have the ability to buy uh, more hydropower, for example. I mean, I'm just wondering what gets us beyond a five to ten percent savings. And it seems to be look at our cost competitiveness versus the other places that you say are taking jobs. That's not going to make a difference. Their their cost of doing tap water. Um, there's two things. We're, we're, the, uh, every supplier is is required to buy renewable a certain amount of renewable energy, uh, and, and you get credits for that. Reps. Okay. Um, as I said, I've I've had uh, one. I know of two bi biomass generators in the state that have approached us about purchasing power directly from them. Um, so that may be three and a half cent power, for instance, um, because it's it's buying it directly from the generator rather than buying it through the ISO process. Um, and and the the purpose of the broker is to capture opportunities like that. Uh, another way is, is if, depending upon when we purchase electricity, um, at least insofar as the medium and the, and the larger accounts are concerned, um, electricity generated at 3 a.m. is really cheap. And so if you can purchase a lot of electricity at 3 a.m., you could still charge the, the, the 6 a.m. or the 7 a.m. rate so you have an additional level of revenue. But that's, that, that's already built into your model, I'm assuming. Uh, it depends on, on the kind of customers that we have. Um, if you have a number of 24-7s, um, if you have a, a number of, uh, for instance, convenience stores, which have a lot of refrigeration, which are open, have a lot of lighting. Uh, it, uh, uh, hospitals, for instance, uh, nursing homes, uh, you know, any number of, of facilities that that have 24-7 operations, hotels. Uh, those, that's where you can really capture a lot of, a lot of uh, increased savings and uh, ostensibly greater revenue than just the residential and commercial small business accounts. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, you uh, speak about the broker. So I'm how, sorry? The broker? Yeah. How do you calculate the payment to the broker by so many cents per kilowatt? Uh, we, we, we built into the model a, uh, a number of mills uh, per, uh, per kilowatt. Per, so we, have, we start off with, let's say again, you know, a five cent uh, wholesale rate. And then we, we build, then there are, there are um, ancillary charges that ISO charges, brings it up another, you know, three, four mills. Um, uh, and then the broker would charge a certain number of mills on top of that for their services, much as, much as the, the, the brokerage fees you would pay for any, any uh, stock brokerage. The difference perhaps, the major difference is that with much of the stock brokerage you pay when you withdraw your funds, uh, as opposed to paying on an ongoing basis. So a broker would bid for this job? I guess I'm just trying to figure out you know, we put out a request money yep. in the process. Yep. We we put out a re we put out a request for qualifications, and we sent out oh at least to eight different firms. We received one, and the point of that is that uh, this is the company uh, that has that that manages about 54 percent of the uh, the accounts that are in New England. Uh, Obviously, the, the relationship between the municipalities and the broker would need to be worked out and, and you know, formalized and contractualized, if that's a word, um, on, on a going forward basis. But you establish that, that relationship, you establish that, that mill rate at the beginning. Okay. I always, because I do think of Southern Maine as the economic engine for the state, I also and I, I did bring this up uh, when South Portland was talking about it originally. The whole issue is um, during uh, the gubernatorial campaign, there certainly was one candidate who talked about this very, um, uh, I, I call option, mm -hmm. shall we say. And um, 
we have a, a governor who's looking for cash and um, to save money, make money, whatever, like we all do, but, but you know. Um, so if this works, and I think about um, the times when South Portland uh, made lots of money with the inventory tax. I mean, it was, it was a cash cow. And that was, in, and then came the Johnny Martins from up there, who, who said, uh oh, they've got lots of money. And they took it and then reduced what we could uh, actually gain. So I worry about setting, I'm sorry, um, um, but it takes somebody to, to look at what happens if. Okay, so if we were successful in pulling this off, how do we know, you know, that, that our small, and it would be a fairly small company, comparatively, to having everyone in the state um, on board buying. So if the state should right. see that that's, that's a money maker, then we've already got it. I looked through here and I, I saw two staff people, accounts receivable marketing. I'm sorry, that's a good 110, 120,000 okay. pennies, okay. right? I think about it. You know, I try to try to think long term versus just short term. Um, and I, at one point, you mentioned option in, option out, standard offer. So I guess I'm just saying, uh, if we opt in um, and we do well, um, do we grow? And um, uh, there's a couple of different ways to answer this. Um, First of all, the, the state did look at this a few years ago and decided not to follow through. Um, it's, it, and there may be, a, I'm sure there are a number of very good reasons, but they chose not to. Um, this idea came out of a need, a feeling of, of needing to do something other than, you know, if, 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 I, if I can control energy prices or, or deal with energy prices in a way that benefits the businesses that are here, that's great, okay? Um, it would take the state some time to establish something like this. Um, by way of example, the uh, state is, through Efficiency Maine Trust, is establishing the, the, the property assessed clean energy loan program. Uh, that was supposed to, that's, those are low interest loans for, for weatherization uh, for homeowners. That was supposed to be put in place by September. It'll be March. Um, if, for whatever reason, it took an awful long time to get that in place. Um, I, I think we'd have plenty of warning that the state was wanting to try to capture or, or to replace our capability. But, but at the same time, there's at least in, in so far as, as the, the current history shows, there's still the standard offer. So the exit strategy for anyone who's either unhappy with our rate, doesn't feel it's enough, 5% isn't enough, um, they can opt back into the, the standard offer. Um, by the same token, we would see the writing, we would follow this, we would see the writing on the wall and say, if this is going to become this much, much of an issue in terms of capturing market, then we should bow out, let's, let's recoup our costs, because we've been following those costs and recouping them as we go forward. The other thing is that the license, uh, and I don't want to get too far out there, but the, the license with the PUC would allow us ostensibly to, to have a customer in virtually any part of CMP's uh, market area if someone so chose. Um, if we chose, the, if we decided to get a market, to get a, uh, a license from the PUC for the entire state, Okay, now I'm not, I mean, that's an order of magnitude that frightens me, but the point is, is that there's, there's, there are, there is enough uh, market share out there, I believe, uh, that w could support probably a number of us that might, municipalities or cooperatives that might want to venture into this. The thing that, that is most daunting is the initial cash flow requirements. Uh, and so you have to, you have to, you know, 
build the model as strongly and as carefully and, as, and, and with as much certainty as possible. Uh, so I, I, could the state uh, establish a law that would preempt um, this? I don't know, but I, I go back to what I said earlier that if, as, and, and you, I believe, were the one that asked, one of the people that asked the question, what if the standard offer, the wholesale rate ends up being the same price as the standard offer? Well, then we, we fold up shop and mission accomplished because the point here was to provide energy less expensively than what it is now. Uh, the, the transmission and delivery costs are not going to change. In the case of residential, it's 6.7 cents. Small business, 6.7 cents. There's fluctuations with, with larger users over whether it's off-peak or on-peak purchase. But those aren't going to change. It's, it's how much of a difference is there between the wholesale rate and the standard offer rate. And that's a function of uh, the, the price and the supply and the demand of gas. When Sable Island, the Sable Island field suddenly appeared to, to be a whole lot less uh, viable as a gas field, the price of gas went up. Now there's a tremendous amount of gas supply in Western Canada, um, in, in, in Calgary. Um, you know, there are things such as you have, you have on-demand oil-fired generators who may go away because of the cost of oil, uh, because of the kind of plant that they are. Well, something's going to have to take that place. We don't have a nuclear plant that's, that's online. Um, so something will have to take that place, and it may mean the gas prices go back up again, which then increases the difference between the wholesale and the, and the, the, the standard offer price, the retail price. Thank you. Eric? If, if I might, maybe I, if I could ask Greg a question. What's the risk in this? I know you've done a lot of the financial work. It's, you know, we, we talked about the potential of bad debt, the potential of, of uh, you know, buying, agreeing to buy so much power and then not selling it. What, what are some of those different risks? Um, in the early stages, uh, it's a matter of picking up the customer base sufficient to cover your operating costs. So that's what I call startup risk loss. And um, it's going to cost, if, if you have two people on staff that can service 4,000 customers, your likelihood is that it isn't going to cost you anything more, <coughs> any more, to serve six or seven or eight thousand customers. So the goal is is that in the early stages you want to pick up the customers at a pretty rapid state because your operating costs are fixed. <coughs> so in the early stages, if you don't pick up those customers on a quick on a quick basis you're going to be incurring the loss. So you get that, what I call, the startup risk. Um, that their consumers are hesitant to, to switch over to our energy supply. That's a risk. Uh, the second risk is, is that um, you're buying a block of, of power, uh, say a, a, a mega, whatever the, the, the denomination is, um, and and maybe Freedom Light can, can, uh, can answer this question better than I, but if you're buying a block of power, a mega power, and then in the summertime, you get uh, a spike up in power because all the, uh, the air, conditioning. Air, conditioning. air conditioning that's going on, uh, you might have to buy power because you're, you bought your block of power to meet a standard load. Well, if you exceed that standard load, you're going to be buying from the the retail market at whatever the price might be. Um, and there will be other times when your load goes below what you purchased and you're going to be selling your power. The, the thought process is on a historical basis, your gains or losses pretty much equal out and you you're, you're remain whole for the buying and the selling of the process of the electricity. But in my mind, there's still risk there in that you say you're going to sell your power at seven cents, and you're you believe that you're going to be able to buy the power at six and a half cents on an average basis. And in my mind, there's still some risk there on a, a long-term basis. That there may be times in which you're losing money, and there may be times when you're gaining money. And the hopes are that you're going to be 
the two are going to equal out. And I'm a, I, I think Mike and some of the others would already know, I'm a pessimist uh, on, on, a, on a group of us that have been pulling this model together. Uh, so that's a fear that I, that I have <coughs> in some respects. Uh, I think the concept is excellent. It's an excellent concept. It's as simple as standard offer is up here, wholesale is down here. Now, what the goal is is that you can sell the power somewhat below the standard offer to the consumer, but a savings to the consumer. And then the second component is can you buy the power at a low enough margin? that you can operate at a profit in that middle ground between what you're selling it to the consumer and what you're paying for it. And the so model is showing that you typically could do that in the, in the environment, but that's, that's going on a model assumption. So who, who would be making those decisions? Uh, I would assume that we would have a board that would be formed that would establish certain criteria for the operations of the, uh, of the power group. Um, and effectively, you would not do the trigger to uh, bring on those, say it's a thousand customers equals a meg. And I think that's pretty much where we're going on, is a thousand customers equals a mega power. So you need a board with expertise. Mm -hmm. It's to some expertise, but uh, I, you get a broker that also has a level of expertise and a consultant in that regards that can advise you in that regards. But so, they have to be paid. I mean, the, they have to the, make some money. The broker is paid from their fee that they charge for the right. sale of the electricity. Mm -hmm. okay. So you don't, the, my point is, is that you don't bring on that mega power until you assured that you're going to be able to buy that power at a sufficient margin to be on a profitable basis. So that's, that's some safeguards in, in, in a lot of respects, is that you're buying it and you're only bringing on those customers when you have an appropriate margin. Um, so you could effectively, if you never hit that point, uh, then all you're at risk for is that initial startup cost that you might have. Let me, let me just add one thing too, though. You, the, the, pur the purpose of the bilateral sales allows to take advantage of uh, the fact, for instance, that, that electricity is substantially more expensive in Connecticut, New York, metropolitan area than it is here. Uh, and so the, the, purpose, the broker's purpose would be to constantly monitor those things and make those sales when it's opportune, because the more electricity you sell, the more, th the more that they make. Um, and um, so they're, they're, I'm, 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 less, I'm less pessimistic, but I'm, I'm just as wanting to be careful about how to characterize the, the, the process. You, know, you, you build in a, a supply, a, a demand, if you will, that you can, you can match the supply um, and, and to ensure that you make money. And you only bring on customers as it's in your best interest to take on that additional block of customers. So, you have customers set up to come on when you have that proper margin to bring on the next group of customers. Um, just uh, to clarify the question, the uh, cost of the working capital is fairly substantial. Have you built that cost into your model? And also, what's the range of outcomes that your model has given you in, in different assumptions in terms of both margins as well as ROI? I mean, well, generally, the, 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 the net income becomes positive within the first year. Um, but again, it's, it, it really depends on the size of the, of the right, customer right. base. Using various assumptions in terms of size, in terms of cost, and how you operate, what's sort of the worst case that you came out with in terms of margins, and the best case you came out with in terms of margins? Uh, it all is a function of how much savings you want to pass on to the Right, but it's what, bottom line, what you can, you can, you can have a, a, a myriad of, of, of examples. It's a question of, I, mean, I, guess, I guess the best way to characterize it is how much difference can we build into this? It would seem to me it's a really important issue because you have a very, very narrow margin of error in this model. Right. 5% is really small. 
And so I'm curious, when you do pump in your various assumptions, right. what's the worst case, and what's been the best case, and what's the probability of outcome of each one? The modeling, the modeling, maybe the best way I can answer this is the modeling that we've done so far, and, and, and it's a great question and something we need to look further at, uh, but the modeling we've, we've looked at so far puts us about a, a, a penny plus uh, 1.3 mils less all in, less than the standard offer, which is pretty thin margin. So okay. Initially, but when that's we first started talking, when the standard offer was nine and a half, <coughs> the margin was much greater, and it's really had us refocus on uh, the model because when the standard offer reduced to eight and a half, it changed a lot of the dynamics because the margin became less. So it's put us more in a, in a, in a, a you know, uncertain situation here where we, we felt we had a, a, an adequate margin, and with the reduction of the standard offer, the margin got squeezed somewhat. You brought the example earlier of the telecom industry where after the breakup of the bell companies, there were um, a lot of resellers and aggregators. Virtually, essentially, all of them went out of business because that margin, which is basically a wholesale retail spread, evaporated, and the margin of error was tiny, um, and it looked great for a while until, you know, economics club. I just want to point out, uh, you know, one of the challenges of uh, those of us in this business is, is bringing, getting things to the point that they're worthy of a conversation, but not taking them so far that we've overcommitted, and I think we might have struck it just about right here, you know, just enough to be not dangerous, but uh, educated. Uh, the model that's been developed, and, and Eric and Greg deserve a lot of credit in that, um, I think appropriately takes some very conservative assumptions, but we really want to test those assumptions with, with folks beyond our uh, little circle here. So I, I don't think anyone's here tonight saying we have all the answers. In fact, um, we, we really want to know, I think, um, is this uh, a venture worth exploring for? I mean, we're not making any commitments by any stretch. And uh, I, for one, fully appreciate that we have some further testing that needs to be done. Councilor Roy? Yeah, I, I think, too, we've discussed a lot with the charge generation facilities and alternative energy sources uh, you know, to supplement and augment when you're talking about you know, getting one meg you know, and maybe not having enough come July. So there are ways, there are other ways in which we can augment what we're, what we're going to do. But again, those are costs that you know we have to incur as far as the outlay. But those are things that we need to, you know, we'll probably build into that model if we want to succeed right. as we move down the road. Yes. Um, more to Tom's point around, you know, we have a lot more questions to ask um, or get answers to. Do we have any um, plans to pull on an expert who's energy economics simulation modeling so that we pull that kind of mental capacity, power capacity to solve some of these questions that should really be in the economics and energy simulation? And I don't know if that's what you've done. I don't mean to yeah. say that no. we're going to string, string out but, budget uh, okay. every nice time. I mean, it just, it just seems like of all the munis municipalities across the country, I mean, this is, is a concept that's free for anyone to take on, that I think the example of Ohio, the Midwestern states, is really grapefruit and, and grapes uh, in terms of potentially saying, well, is there an analogy there or not? Um, so I guess my question would be, what would our plan be to find more expert opinion, simulation, firepower to really vet this out in, in next steps. Um, we certainly would do that. One of the folks that I would, I would draw on would be, uh, and, and have drawn on, uh, Paul Aubrey's experience, Paul's having worked in the Governor's Office of Energy Independence. Um, there, are other, there are others as well in the, in the field, in the region. Uh, there are attorneys in the region that we could draw on in terms of the uh, their expertise. Uh, we have done this, you know, staff staff level, um, and I, and I'm sure that that uh, there are there are there are um, energy analysts outside the region that we would want to want to vet this model against. Yeah, I'm I'm just doing some back of the envelope kind of calculations here and figuring. I think you said sixty dollars per uh, per account per month. 
3,000 accounts, that's $180,000, 12 years, that's a million, point one, someplace in there, right around a million dollars. What does the broker make on that million dollars of sales? I'm trying to figure out if it's they're, worth they're, swap. They're going to make, I, I can't tell you exactly, but they would make a certain number of mills per, uh, uh, per kilowatt. Uh, so, for instance, again, I go back to uh, five cents kilowatt uh, power. If you buy that at wholesale, their ancillary, ancillary costs of, let's say, four mills, uh, and based on what is negotiated with the, with the broker, uh, there may be two, three, four mills on top of that. Uh, so under percent. Yes, typically under under percent. So that means he makes out a million dollars. He makes ten thousand. Um, no, and I, Paul, help me out on this. I'm getting. Let me ask you. Let me tell you what I'm getting trying to get to. How much money? How much do we have to be turning over before we are getting enough attention from the, uh, uh, the broker? A meg. Uh, we operate in, t in terms of, of, of increments of one megawatt. That's what you need to be able to minimum level of purchase. So we would we would establish. The idea would be to establish you know one megawatt beginning, and then when we have two megawatt, then then kick the broker to, to purchase another additional megawatt, and then when you have a third megawatt, so on and so forth. What's the cost of a megawatt? Approximately. Right now, we want to pull in today. Um, we have a market that's going to try to try to do a uh, pay off, pay off. And I don't want to get. If I start speaking, I'm going to get the really down, we'll do this all basically try to be as very straightforward as possible. Okay. Guess, guess what? The whole concept here, and, and I don't want to. I've got to make in essence, the point that we've been trying to convey to the whole model is simply this. Everything that Eric said is basically how you help the resident and still build a scenario that you're building a model that you can help protect yourselves with a tool for the future because we don't want to happen to energy would happen to oil. Right? We want some kind of a tool to control that market at least a little bit. So we want to be in the wholesale market somehow. So you go to the wholesale market and you're in your supplier. Right? Well, this is municipality. We want to make sure you mitigate risk as much as possible. So we're not saying uh, our, our ideas here is necessarily that you're going to go and you're going to buy in the hour. You're going to buy you know, this hour, next hour, next hour. What Eric was saying at some point in this conversation and uh, description here was that what we want to do is a certain strike price. And we know we can, you know we know standard offer is set for 12 months. Okay, we know what that rate is. So instead of looking at what can I buy it today, what can I buy it tomorrow, what can I buy it for the week, that's not our concern. Our concern is what can we buy for the year? Because right? we don't we don't want to be playing that game. We'll play that game with our corporate customers because they have a certain level, and I hope you understand my point when I say this, they have a certain level of, of um, risk that they're allowed to go and take, risk reward. You folks risk averse. Well you're supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, and I can speak as also as a resident, <laughs> you're my tax dollars, you're running my town. Um, so I don't, you know, even though I go out there and I manage large entities and they're large loads and I don't do this for big corporations, um, a lot of people want to be in the market and buy out. And it makes sense in their model. We don't want you to do that. We think it's illogical to do it because you don't want to, you want to reduce resources to public. We want to get to a lot fixed price. And there are certain times a year when we can do that that's most beneficial, the lowest rates, like spring and fall. And if I go in deeper than that, it's very confusing. But there's spring and fall. So what our point basically is, is we know standard offer comes out in March. March 1st is a new standard offer, 849, 06. We know it was 902. 902 looked a hell of a lot better than 849 does for a margin. But that's what it is. And it's beautiful that it happened because it spurs these conversations. Our point is just simply this. We go out we make sure when we do a buy, that we buy at the time of the year, we're going to do, uh, we're going to put that into into uh, motion at, at such a point that we know we're going to buy lower than that. So we're not going to announce, we are not going to announce our rate, right, for the supply group. We're never going to announce that prior to standard offer coming out. Standard offer comes out, 
It's a 10 cents. Okay? We look at markets, we know what we can do. Okay? We either buy ahead of or after, but we, want, we have stagger time. So we're going to stagger this. Okay, we have to be 10 cents. We're going to start off, we're not going to do the same time as Dan Lambert does. We're going to wait till soft, soft months and buy them. Bang. We know we're able to buy. If we weren't able to buy, we won't. Why bother? If we can't be, the point is to help the residents and it, and it generate some revenue so we have a backstop to our tax base. So well, that's, that's the whole point right there. Annual purchasing. And you, then you, you, there's all kinds of purchase ideas and you can stagger and all kinds of things. But in the end, it's just simply that. The point is to buy the lower standard offer. If I guarantee you're going to, no. It's like your 401k broker, you know, I'm sorry, uh, you know, here's our goal. We're going to diversify the risk. Um, now, I like to say that I'm not your 401k broker. So our, our, yeah, our whole point basically is just that. Our goal is to purchase a fixed block of power. And we're not looking at going and trying to get 21,000 people all, you know, rolling today and tomorrow and the next day, and then come in, in March and in December. Because you don't want to roll people in December if you don't have power purchase for that because you're going to lose your shirts. It's very expensive. And so these are the things that Eric and, and Greg and Paul, we've all, we've all talked about. Okay, so how do we do it? We stagger our bots. And we take a big group of people so we know what we're purchasing for. And if they're interested, and they're interested, if they can be lower than X, will you come to our group? Absolutely. It's the only option I have to save anything. Okay, good. And then when we have enough people to plateau, and the buy time comes, you purchase that block. And this is super conservative. You purchase that block, and that's, that, that goes for them. And then we, we continue to get people. People come in. You say, Greg, I, I want to be in on this. My, my, my neighbors save an 8%. You know, it's not a million bucks, but why would I give somebody else? Okay. So, we'll, we'll put you in the pool. You know, but we're not going to give it to you tomorrow. We don't, have the, we don't have the power for you. We're going to wait to the next buy cycle. As we generate revenue, and as we get through our working capital, get that back, then we have cash flow. Right? We've got some, we were putting that into an account, we're saving for the rainy day. We, want, we, want, we need to make sure that we're taking care of it here. As we have that, we get more flexible. Because now as we have money sitting here, we may be able to take a little bit of risk and say, okay, well, we do have a backstop now. Working capital's paid back, we're good. Worst case scenario, everything goes you know, to hell in a handbasket. The customers, they didn't pay a dime for it. There's no risk on the customer side. The residents are fine. Right? Worst case, what happens to them? Worst case scenario. Back to standard offer where they were. What happens to this <coughs> in the scenario I'm talking about here? Well, the work capital's paid back. We get to that point. And so they go, okay, close doors. We don't, we, don't, we don't place an order for the power. It doesn't make sense to do so. We can't make money doing it. But if we have a nice amount of cash after working capital built up. Now we start saying, okay, look what we've got here. We have this money here. We have people coming in. And, oh, more importantly, we have TV Bank, we put a call center in anywhere around here. We can start helping our, our communities. We can start saying, okay, we have some money to work with here. We, there's all kinds of options once you have that. Once you're no longer working and paying back working capital, now you can say, okay, well, maybe I'm going to take a little bit of risk. And we have a boatload of people coming in. They really they like this. The neighbors are doing it. We can pull people in, and we have, we have that buffer now. So maybe we can buy a block or a strip or a short-term strip, you know, at a little higher rate. Not quite the same margin we had before, but we're servicing our customers. We're not losing money anymore. You know, it's, there's, the whole point really is just to answer your question. I'm very long, I apologize. Was we're not going to buy today. We're going to wait until the prices are historically at certain levels, balance them against standard offer, and if we have the margins we need, we purchase. What about the, the, the uh, scenario that uh, Eric put forward, where, where in the summertime your demand goes up and you have to, to purchase in order to do that? Well, that's the bottom I'm saying. You know, we, have, we have the same scenario. But with, uh, we have some very large customers, and we have to worry about that. That's what we plan on. We know what we know. What, a lot of historical data to know what's happening. Now, my cousin talked about it. He's a, he's a weather man, right? He's wrong half the time. So hopefully, you know, we have, you have to pay weather, you have to look at natural gas prices, you have to look at all kinds of things happening. That's what we do. I mean, that, that's, that's our job. That's why we're getting paid. If we were just going and saying, okay, someone, who wants to give me, uh, you know, 4.9 power? And, some, and everybody jumps in and goes, like, yeah, buying that. Why do you need us? <laughs> you know, our job is to go out there and model your, your, your load asset. 
Here's what you have. For, here's what your load asset is. Here's what the use is. It. We know that you know we have this kind of stuff in the summertime. This kind of stuff in the wintertime. Your load has to be totally different in Scarborough and in South Portland and Cape Elizabeth than it is anywhere else. Okay, so Aaron, if we, we had 15 minutes left, what's the best way to spend that? Um, well, answer a couple more questions and, and I think get a sense of, of um, what you'd like us possibly to do moving forward. Yes. Um, you, first of all, I want to thank you, and I don't know who else has been working on this, but I want to thank you. It's a really interesting idea, um, and uh, so thank you. I mean, it looks like it's taken a ton of work. Uh, my interests as a town councilor are always in saving money where I can, but I'm also interested in minimizing risk. You, you sort of asked what our thoughts were, mm -hmm. so these are my thoughts that I'll just share with you. Minim minimizing risk, financial risk, competitive risk, political risk. Um, I think we need more information. You know, Frank was talking about sort of what are the parameters of, of the model, um, some sort of sensitivity analysis. So you look at the various variables and what's the minimum and maximum on some of these things because my background is in marketing and uh, consumer behavior uh, and I personally find it, um, think that it will be less than compelling for many residential customers, the, the business customers, I don't know about because they're businesses, they're looking at the bottom line, that's how they make decisions, but the, um, I think the residential customers who, are, who might be looking at spending, uh, at saving $6 a month might think for $6 a month, I'm not sure I want to take the risk of doing something really wild and crazy. So, to them. So, I need, I need more information before I could give any um, commitment. I'd also like information from our town manager on what our municipal electricity bills are, you know, the, the uh, supply side part of them, so that I can understand how much we potentially could save as our, the town itself being a consumer of energy. So those are my thoughts. I'd like more information, but I'm, a li I'm concerned about the risk, uh, and I'm concerned about the uh, level of interest among residential consumers for this sort of project. So that just sort of very, very briefly, the only thing, the, the thing that, that occurs to me is that you may have a, a number of residents who say, I like the fact that my municipality is doing something that, I mean, again, I'm buying, I'm going to be buying electricity. The plan is, the model is to buy electricity and pay the same rate for, for that consumer for, for the year. So for a year, as a consumer, I know I'm going to be paying X, which is a few dollars less than the standard offer. Right. But my there's, a, there's a certain inertia. Oh, like, sure. I'm, sure. I'm a customer who would be an electrical an electricity customer who would be fully knowledgeable, supposedly, <laughs> when we get this all together. And I'm not even sure that I'd be interested in switching over just because of the inertia. You know, I mm -hmm. probably would, but there's a lot of other people who are just would just not understand this and would be saying. Why is our town government, people want government, and we're talking about they want government to be smaller. Why is the government getting involved in this, competing with the private sector? See, I, I'm not sure people would understand this all. It's hard to understand. So, so that's just, those are just my initial <clears throat> impressions. I don't know if you can answer this, but what effect is it on the consumer? Like, how would I switch over? I mean, is it that hard? No. You know what I mean? Like, would it be that difficult for a consumer just to make a phone call and be like, no, you'd, have to, you'd have to su submit a written request um, to the, the, the supply company that you want to uh, uh, switch over. CMP uh, will allow you to do that uh, at any, within with 30 days notice if you do it at the time, the, the right time of their billing cycle. Their, their, I'm sorry, their meter reading cycle, then, it, then there's no extra charge. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of, because again, they're just delivering it. Right. Uh, they get their, their money in terms of the billing. So would the people that were supposedly going to hire the staffing positions, would they be responsible for that? I'm just thinking, getting consumers to do all of that, write a letter, make sure it's at the right time for 
an average of, you know, <coughs> six bucks maybe a, a month. I mean, and then on top of that, we're only going to be adding customers at certain times, so it's not like they can just do it whenever they want. We are only going to be taking them on like every six months we're going to be buying a block, or every year we're going to be buying a block and adding more customers. I'm just concerned about mm -hmm. the consumer, like, you know, and said that they might lose interest, they might not follow through, our customer base isn't going to be as big as it, it could be, and we end up not succeeding. I think it's right. it's really it's education. Well, it's, I think it's a real important education. point. I suspect some folks in this room, uh, but I, I really think a, a lot of folks still think CFP gives them their power Absolutely. and are totally oblivious to what happens on the back side. Well, that's so there's a me, myself, I was like, I didn't so realize it went through all this. Process, it's like, yeah. Just an education process, and you, you could do form letters for them that they may have to sign. Uh, you know, these, truthfully, I mean, how many of us, you get that standard offer thing in, in your envelope? Do you really ever read it? <laughs> no. You throw it in the you know, you throw it in the garbage and you the recycle bin. The recycle bin. <laughs> yeah, right. that's a lot of staff time too. Yeah. Well, that's my Our residents are like they need a lot of sometimes yes. And I think consortium wise if we you know, if we're collective with this and we proceed forward again the shared cost of those staff. Persons. You also have the capability of, of, of putting inserts into property tax bills, for instance. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, Eric, you might, have, might want to mention the survey that we did with our residents and the results from that. Yeah. Yeah. But just following up quickly, quickly upon the risk, um, we've workshopped this twice in South Portland, I think, and have been talking about it for six or eight months. And while we've talked about branching out, I was a bit surprised that we came here this evening, and I'm always delighted to work with Scarborough and Cape Elizabeth. My question is, did we do that because we need a wider consumer base? Do we also need more players in the upfront cost? Which, which was, I think that's why we're here. Did we find out that our numbers were insufficient to work, the risk was too great? And if this is the case, Eric, why aren't we going across the bridge and we could double, we could, we could cut our risk in half, double our consumers and double the upfront needs? Um, Okay, you've, you've, you've asked the $64 million question uh, number, to t try to take it apart piece by piece. First of all, we, we sent out 9,000 plus um, surveys to property owners and we got back 15% uh, response and to the one that they were positive. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe, I, I believe we possibly got one or two phone calls that said, what are you guys, nuts? Um, we we, we looked at this, and, and speaking to the political risks and the, and the financial risks, we looked at this and said, you know, this is a lot for, for one municipality to take on. We could conceivably take on the, the, the rate payers of other communities based on our PUC license if we so chose. But at the same time, it's a, it's a pretty daunting task. Um, the other thing is that as we discussed this with uh, 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 Scarborough and, and then with, with Mike and Cape is that there, there's a synergy between the three communities and that was enough for us to explore this with you all and just frankly from my perspective the fact that you've got three communities together sitting down talking about this and exploring this is a great is a great success regardless of how we go forward um, so we are it, it is a, it is a function of minimizing financial risk it's a minimize it's a it's a function of uh, spreading some of the working capital requirements. Um, obviously, the number of residents and, and businesses in Cape is significantly different than, than Scarborough or, or, or um, uh, South Portland. There's a considerable economies of scale in that in South Portland building alone, uh, we would have thought that to get the economies of scale, we might have had to get a penetration of 30%. And there was some risk involved in that. So when Scavro started talking about it, we said, well, if our costs are going to be fixed, we can essentially share the risk of, of, that, of that, you know, need, the need to bring on 3,000 customers. It would have been an easier task when we would have the economies of scale that we could bring on 5,000 customers effectively at the same cost as we would have on a 3,000 scale model. So in that regards, it made a lot more sense of looking at this 
on a joint basis than on a single basis. Yeah, the other thing I'll just say is that you know, Scarborough studied this, and, and Eric has done a lot more in South Portland. Um, what I found helpful is getting the three towns together with our staffs, and we really started to punch holes in the model. And I think we all had some apprehension going into it, and still do, frankly. Uh, but the model is much more robust now and much more realistic than it ever was. Tonight is all about taking the next level, is, is exposing it to higher scrutiny, political, financial, legal, all of that. And so, uh, again, I don't, we don't have all the answers. We have the germ of an idea that it's pretty exciting. I mean, I can't think uh, of another opportunity in my professional career where we have a chance to save our ta uh, taxpayers' money somehow. Usually it's the other way around, isn't it? And it's worth at least talking to them about it. Just a, a, a technical answer. The reason for not going across the bridge is that this model works much better for credit collection purposes in communities with a high level of owner-occupied housing as opposed to rental housing. I'm sorry, can I let Peter Ingram say something? Yeah, it's very knowledgeable on the yeah, yeah. <laughs> My name is Peter Ingram. I live on Hunts Point Road in Cape Elizabeth. For full disclosure purposes, though, I have to say I work for Constellation Energy. We're the current retail provider for all three towns that are represented here tonight. And I'm not here to go into the level of detail that's been discussed about the proposal that's been put in front of you, but I do want to say that I am an energy expert. I am available to all of you as part of our contract obligation to talk to you in more detail, both about the pros and cons and some of the risks that we're addressing here. Um, I live nearby, and if anybody would like to set up that sort of meeting, I would love to sit down and talk to you for an hour. So, thank you for your time. Thank Thanks, you. sir. Yes. I, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for all the work you've done. These kind of things have been difficult to pull off. And I think the towns need to do more of this kind of joint effort in order to save money. And I think it's a great idea. Just, just kind of a summary point I would make is that um, <clears throat> when I look at uh, companies that tend to invest in and I look at the, the range of potential outcomes and key, a key factor here for kind of distilling this model, if this were a company, you'd say the premise of a company is that we're going to sell the same product <coughs> to customers at a 5 or 7, 10% discount and that's it. And yet, would you be willing to invest in that company? And it just seems like a very, to me, it's a very, very low margin. I personally wouldn't finance a company if that was the entire premise of the uh, notion. So I, I think if you, if you, as you work on this model, if you see opportunities for higher margins, higher probability of returns, then it becomes really interesting. Um, but at that level, the, the risk to me seems out of way to more. You're absolutely, I mean, I, I share that because when we went into this, we were looking at nine cents, you know, plus kilowatt uh, for, for a standard offer. So there was two cents difference, which made a, a big difference in terms of, and th it's, we don't know what next year will be for the standard offer. The standard offer has gone up and down. Typically it's gone down each year, but again, you know, based on what happens with, with natural gas, we don't know. Um, there was another, one, a couple of last questions, yeah? What? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, say hypothetically that the three municipalities were to go forward with this. Um, how would the startup costs uh, that each municipality were to bring uh, to the table and calculate? 30, 30, 30. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I, I, I would, it would probably be based on load. Um, that would, you know, load or load or number of customers. I mean, I think it's, that's probably the most reasonable. Yeah. Each local agreement established. Sure. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that, um, and, and I hope we get a chance to open to public comment as well. But the gentleman who just spoke here, it seems to me that what the next level is is that level of expertise that takes it. I mean, I think that there's been a lot of work done, and, and as uh, Tom Blake said, our council has met twice on this. Uh, however, you know, so if we were to want to have further conversations about it, then it seems like what's the next level of sophistication of information that we need to have, and who can analyze that data for us so we can get to more of the questions that Frank was asking about, you know, is there a greater margin uh, for profit or not, and, and who really has that level of expertise. I don't know whether it's this gentleman or someone like him, but it seems like that there's an energy 
uh, you know, economics expert out there who needs to really uh, work with the three communities and bring us some hard data because I agree with what Ann said. I mean, I'm interested in saving some money, but also not wanting to go way out on a limb of a, on a creaky limb that might feel kind of risky, both politically and financially for residents. So it seems to me that if we've come here and we've agreed that this is now, the three communities are together, we're sharing some information that's helpful, we're maybe coming uh, on board with with a similar level of knowledge and what Tom Hall said from Scarborough is, okay, so now we've done that. What, what's the next level of scrutiny? You know, put it through us, we're not experts. So who needs to analyze this next and help guide us in one direction or another? I, early on I did ask Charlie Colgan from USN to take a look at this. Um, I certainly would, would ask him um, again. But you're, you're right, I mean, the next level is to drill down and get, get those who work in the field to examine it. And, and, and again, the, the model is, is based on uh, trying to grow that difference, that, that space between the, the wholesale and the standard offer. And 5%, yes, it is very much a, why bother? But at 8, 10%, you know, does that, does that, is that enough to push people over? I don't know. Can't answer that. I the margin the and the risk question. factor, though. I think. I'm sorry? The margin and the risk factor. So even if margin grows, but if risk then also increases, you don't... The risk is always, I think the risk is always going to be there in terms of the business model based on the number, based on the fact that you have a cycle between billing, you have a, a billing cycle, account receivable versus account payable cycle. Yeah, um, I'm hoping an expert can help us mitigate the risk and show I, us oh, how absolutely. to lessen that yeah, absolutely. Um, somehow. Eric? Yeah. And we did have one person from the audience speak, and I think there's only two others. So That's I, why I said I'm hoping you know Being good elected representatives, let's hear from the public. And then You're on. <laughs> uh, Gary Crosby, I guess that's the answer to speak with that microphone. Um, it's leaving me almost speechless tonight. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a multi business owner, I own a number of businesses. And, and I'm going to start with, I'll keep it really short tonight. I'll, I'll get into it later on. But um, as Ronald Reagan said at one point, I know some of you are not fans of some of you are, but the nine scariest words you'll ever hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. This one, <laughs> I, I hope you all, in all seriousness, think about that as you leave here tonight. This, I mean, I'm writing down stuff left and right. This is fraught with problems. And Councilor Frank, I don't know what you're talking about. Governor. Governor. You brought up something that was. <laughs> I'm sorry. You brought up something that was really probably one of the most important things I've heard tonight, which is if you're only going to see a five percent return, possibly, would you invest in it? The taxpayers of each one of the communities that each of you represent don't have a choice if, if you, as a group, decide to do this. I have no choice as a business owner, as a resident. My daughter, who has a house in South Florida, my daughter has a house in South Florida, has no choice. She's invested in this company. Uh, so, and somebody else, uh, I think it was yourself, um, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. yeah, um, said about competing with private enterprise. I'm not in the electric business, but nonetheless, you take taking tax dollars, taxpayers' money, you're taking it, you're not asking us to, to invest, you're taking it because we have no choice, and you're investing it in a company. Inappropriate, wholly, wholly inappropriate to take tax dollars from somebody invested in, in a company and compete with private enterprise. I, I appreciate your, your, your thought and trying to save money for the community, but it's just purely inappropriate to compete with private business. Where do we go from here? We're lending money to uh, businesses at this point, periodically, from what I understand, we did with the steel company. Uh, we're looking at a piece of property by next to the town hall and rent it out in the event that we may someday use that space so we're not in real estate business. Now we're going to the energy business. Uh, what's next? Where do you go next? What business are you going to, to compete with and, and, and hurt? If, if people buy from you electricity, they're not buying from this gentleman or whoever else if you're selling. I don't know where but all players are. Uh, and, and I'm just going to leave it at that because I have a list and I'll get it to them later. I have a summer house because I appreciate you letting me get up. I know everybody wants to go. But it is fraught with problems. It really is. And I can I, 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 and, and all of our counselors will get it in email. I'll, I'll let it go. I'll buy, buy, buy. So I don't take a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and you all know me. So, um, but I will do it politely and intelligently and give you things to think about that I hope that you all, if you want to forward it to the other councils and towns, um, I, I welcome you to do it. So thank you. And I appreciate you giving me two minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Is that, is that all the questions? You don't want to say anything? Do you want to speak? No, he's just not here. I'll take some minutes. Well, thank you all for taking the time. Um, and, you know, the questions that you've raised and the concerns and the challenges are all perfectly legitimate and things that we've, we've thought of ourselves and um, we'll consider as we go forward from our perspective. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. much. There. Nice. So you can keep dancing. Good airing of the engine. Good airing of the engine. It says like back in law school all over again. Thanks, Elias. That's so boring.